the title of today's event is Lessons from Our Defeats, but we're not actually talking today about what went right or wrong with Bernie's campaign. You can read a number of postmortem articles that was written about that exact topic. Um, but instead, today we'll be uh, more so discussing enduring truths of um, uh, the world that we live in that existed before Bernie's campaign that contributed both to its success and its failure. So we asked you all to read about four pieces, uh, keeping in mind the spirit of Gramsci's often cited slogan, pessimism of the intellect uh, and optimism of the will, which is admittedly a really difficult balance to strike. Uh, each of these essays recognized the real opportunities that were opened by either the Sanders campaign or the COVID crisis, um, while also being real about the old and new limitations that we continue to face. In all of them, they call for patience, persistence, and careful, incisive judgment on the part of the left. Uh, if we're to take advantage of this oasis of left populism amidst the desert of neoliberalism. So we start with Anton's piece, which uh, for me at least uh, is the most haunting of all of them. Uh, Bernie was obviously our populist leader as a singular figure who organized an amorphous glob of people around demands uh, that were uh, that spoke to many people. Um, and in the absence of, of him on the political stage um, vying for this power, um, we're now at risk for becoming once again disorganized and apathetic. So I know that um, even though those of us who were clear-eyed about the obstacle, there are those of us who are clear-eyed about the obstacles uh, to his campaign and the limitations of his vie for the presidency um, are still saddened by the closing of that opportunity now that he suspended his campaign. Um, you really only have to throw on the, the most recent Bernie video uh, for the, the, the tears to cue out of all of us right now. Um, to know that that's true, that, that we all feel a bit of sadness from him exiting. Um, I can't help but to think of the image of this kind of singular hero who arrives on the scene to fight the battle on behalf of the masses, uh, which is everywhere in our cultural lexicon, um, as well as all of our narratives of, of history. Uh, the comfort and the apparent convenience of these sorts of deus ex machina figures reveals much about our political situation, both in fantasy and in reality. Uh, so this piece for me is haunting because it belies this, uh, the comfort that's in this narrative. That even if Bernie had won, it wouldn't necessarily mean that we win. Um, and there will, there certainly is no hero that's gonna come and save us. Uh, Anton reveals that whether Bernie won or not, we still have a long, messy struggle of building the organizational power of the masses of people who have now lost, or they're, they're currently losing, all organizations within civil society, be they familial, cultural, religious, or economic. Um, but of course, this piece isn't really about Bernie's campaign. Uh, rather, it's uh, about the uh, the world that we find ourselves in with the COVID crisis and the challenge that that poses to the neoliberal order. Uh, his piece recognizes the opportunities that have been opened up by the crisis while acknowledging the constraints that it places on us to take advantage of this opening. As he puts it, the hardness of the hard and hollow environment of the neoliberal state is becoming soft. And this seems to offer the left an opportunity to demand more intervention by the state. But Anton reminds us of the hollowness, which refers to the decline in power for mass democratic organizations like political parties. Uh, that's becoming even more hollow with the added challenges of mobilizing a shut-in citizenry. With Bernie's exit amidst the COVID crisis, we now seem to be standing at the edge of the void that this hollowness creates. In contrast to this piece, um, to this meta-historical character of Anton's P, uh, essay, we have Connor's piece, which is a direct post-mortem of the Sanders campaign that gives a much needed reality check about how far we've actually come within the past half decade. 
He's critical about the reasons that are offered for Sanders' defeat. If only we were nicer, then his opponents would have taken his movement more seriously. Or if only Bernie had pandered better for different voters, blah, blah, blah. They uh, abound with reasons why he, he didn't win. Um, instead, Kilpatrick points out what we've all known all along, which is that the odds were stacked against Bernie. The left made a bet on his candidacy uh, and we took the opportunity to grasp power, but we lost that bet and we couldn't overcome the odds. He reminds us that this is the only, this is only one battle in a war uh, that we must continue to fight. And he offers some optimism for the foreseeable future for class struggle, um, albeit it's a, it's a future that's increasingly distant um, and deferred or maybe even sabotaged by the power of capital. Um, and it certainly lives beyond the short attention span of an election cycle. Uh, ultimately, though, he admonishes the left uh, that the left must get good at long-term strategic thinking. If Anton's piece presents a larger interpretation of history and Connor's essay is more so commenting on current events, then Dustin's two essays provide a medium-term link for how socialists could and should strategize uh, to build our way out of this mess. Dustin presents us with a plan to build toward some sort of organizational power. His argument regarding the failure of third parties is bolstered by Anton's case about the hollowing of institutions, uh, particularly the point that the mere existence of such institutions, things like churches, unions, community associations, and political parties, uh, does not mean that they will be effective as a force for the will of the people. And Dustin offers an historical analysis for why third parties have failed uh, in our rigid two-party system, and he cautions against the impulse to redirect the energy of our small and still weak left into the creation of a third party. However, he also respects the urgency we all feel to do something. Uh, so in his essay that he co-authored with Jared Abbott, he puts forth the idea of building uh, what they call a party surrogate, which isn't really um, all that dissimilar to the DSA. Um, as the inter in, but it acts as an intermediary organization on the path towards a meaningful electoral strategy for the left. Sanders' campaign has popularized demands for policies that would require a redistribution of wealth unseen since FDR's New Deal. Uh, his campaign shattered the edifice of Democrats' craven, half ass efforts to paint themselves as a left party. His policy agenda in many ways meets the needs of the working class, uh, but obviously it doesn't fulfill the promises of socialism. And yet the sober among us know that we must fight for them anyway. Uh, we, we shouldn't fight for them um, uh, not because each policy itself is, a revolution, is revolutionary, uh, but rather because they rally the working class and provide an opportunity to organize as a class. Sanders was able to make it as far as he did because he was able to search the gap between politics and policy that had been created in the neoliberal age. Uh, in these two pieces, we're reminded that the task of socialism has always been to build the working class as a class, not only in itself, but of itself. Uh, the hardness of state of this state of things is becoming soft, as Anton puts it, uh, and now we must figure out the long and slow process of filling the void. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Anton, who's going to give us a hard dose of the red pill, and uh, I guess it's up to us to take it or not. So go ahead. Let me unmute you. All right, you're unmuted. Uh, you're unmuted you now. You haven't, yeah. You, can you hear me? I think you have an automatic mute function or something. Um, if there are any issues, just tell me. Um, yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. Thank, thanks so much for the introduction. So I'll talk about 25 minutes. I don't think I'll stick too close to the original article. Um, and what I'm going to give is probably somewhere between a pep talk and a therapy session. So it's not exactly a pep talk, but it's not exactly a therapy session either. Um, and I think this original piece was written about a very aggressive pessimism. Yeah. Like you made... want to that door back there? yeah. We'll, uh, bring it out. Okay. Thank you.
Okay. Um, and I think um, I wouldn't stand behind all of the like grand claims I make in it. Um, I do think um, even if I don't want to come over as overly pessimistic, what's been really valuable about the last 10 years of left populism, both in Europe and in America, is that it has made us realize just how, uh, how steep the climb is going to be. So I often like to use the metaphor of climbing a mountain, um, that you need to have a sense just how long the journey and how steep the climb is going to be before you even start with the journey. And if you arrive there ill-prepared and you're packing provisions and you're getting all your camping materials together, that you need to have a sense where the top of the mountain lies and just how rocky the terrain is going to be. Um, and what the last 10 years at least have learned us is that we've got a better sense of the terrain on which we're operating and we're able to draw historical lessons from that. Uh, which is a big difference from the 2000s, I think, um, when the left was not even trying to climb the mountain, but was just basically getting um, walking straight into the valley or getting lost in the bushes. As I like to say, at least the 2010s gave us something to squander, and we can draw some valuable lessons from what was, actually, was, what was exactly squandered in the 2010s. So what I'll be mostly doing is talking about the strengths and weaknesses of left populism in the last 10 years. Um, I'll be assuming a kind of basic equivalence between European and American cases here. Although I do think that a lot of the phenomena I'm discussing in the European case start in the US a lot earlier. Um, so the hollowing out of mass parties, the retreat of the citizenry into the private sphere, uh, the decline of mass membership organizations and of collective institutions is something that America sees much earlier. Um, we all know that America now is basically a party state with non-membership parties. Um, but we can see that Europe is slowly evolving towards a um, similar situation. So I think you can draw a careful um, equivalence between both of them. So the first thing I want to do is actually just explain what made left populism possible or where it exactly uh, came from. And I think you can situate the rise of left populism in the last 10 years on two intersecting timelines. Uh, one is a long-term timeline and the other is a more short-term timeline. Um, the long-term one is precisely this rise of the void or the hollowing out of uh, mass institutions that really started uh, to get going from the 1980s onwards. So the long-term driver of left populism is the fall of party democracy um, and the fact that people start relating to politics in a completely different way. Um, so this is a time when politics very much is not about uh, creating a collective will or getting people together to achieve certain interests. People relate to politics um, as if it's like a consumer, shop, uh, a consumer market in which there are different options on offer and in which uh, marketeers or political marketers try and sell different options uh, to people in a different way. And this is a development that Laney takes off in the 1980s, which really accelerates in the 1990s which hollows out these old mass parties, which at the same time also hollows out these institutions. And I think which creates two separate responses, which are actually two sides of the same coin. So what you could call PR politics and protest politics. So PR politics basically assumes that parties don't need a mass membership. They don't need to have large sections of the population within their party. They um, can just rely on spin doctors, they can rely on political marketing research to find out what kind of opinions are popular within the citizenry, and then they can pitch their political message to uh, this specific marketing research. Um, so this is one side, which was, uh, of course, innovated on the right, but which even was done by social democratic parties in Europe in the 1990s, which a democratic party leaned into very heavily in the 1990s. Um, but it is countered by something on the left, which you could call the rise of protest politics. Um, so instead of expressing demands through strikes or through action on the shop floor, a large part of the activity on the left becomes exclusively restricted to having manifestations in public squares, in making your demands visible, uh, mainly through the media. And what you can see, uh, what PR politics and protest politics share in common is that they both rely very, very heavily on visibility and they both rely very, very heavy on uh, media attention. So PR politics mainly works with spin doctors, while protest politics is mainly about shout shouting certain slogans or making yourself visible um, in, the, in the public sphere. Um, and <clears throat> in the end, both PR politics and protest politics share the same limits insofar as they're an incredibly fleeting and very disorganized way of actually gathering people together 
in the, uh, in the same space. So if we talk about the anti-war movement in the 2000s, or we talk about the anti-austerity protests that took off uh, after 2008, um, there clearly was a lot of anger within the population and there clearly was a constituency ready to be mobilized, but the base on which they were mobilized was incredibly fleeting and didn't actually create any lasting institutions. So this is the kind of long-term development which gets left populism going in the 2010s because left populists finally realize that this mode of protest politics um, is not the way forward. It's not the way you actually get any uh, concrete results and uh, it doesn't build any durable institutions that you can, you can get you those results. I think the more short-term timeline we should take into account is just the fallout of the 2008 crisis and how this 2008 crisis was managed uh, politically. Um, so most of you will be very familiar with this story, but I think what we need to take into account is just how the 2008 crisis impacts different classes and how its impact on different classes makes certain political coalitions possible. What is very specific about 2008, although its heaviest burden is on the working class, who have their homes foreclosed, who are obviously um, made redundant in mass numbers and who are suffering tremendously, it also has a very sensitive and difficult impact on parts of the professional class. So um, children of the higher educated or parts of the higher educated professional class also mainly see their employment prospects eviscerated uh, have to live in cities with skyrocketing rents, um, have to see how the action of central banks basically fuels these housing <laughs> bubbles, <clears throat> which um, make it even more difficult for them to maintain their livelihoods. And this means that you have two groups in society who are, in a sense, impacted by 2008, both the lower side of the professional class and a large part of the working class. Um, so while it radicalizes part of the professional class, it also pulls in part of the working class who are now interested in a form of politics that can actually remedy their immiseration. Um, <clears throat> but the important thing to take in uh, account is that this professional class is within these coalitions with a distinctly different aim uh, than the working class. It has different ideas of what ideal forms of employment are, uh, for example, it's way more comfortable with flexible contracts and it likes to assist on autonomy and how it uh, um, negotiates its own labor contracts, for example. Um, it has cultural differences with that old working class. And the professional class mainly experiences 2008 as a broken promise um, insofar as they had a place in some of these liberal or left liberal parties, mainly social democratic parties in Europe, which in the 2000s, in the time of the credit boom, gave all these employment opportunities to the professional class. And after 2008, as austerity kicks in, suddenly this professional class sees that this promise is not kept. So they see it mainly as a form of betrayal vis-a-vis -a, -vis a capitalist class that uh, can't fulfill its prospects. While in the working class, um, the austerity crisis is mainly experienced as just one layer on top of an existing layer of suffering. Um, but this means also that the professional class relates um, to politics in a very different way from the working class. And it makes a coalition between those two groups slightly, diff uh, slightly more difficult because professional class comes with a sense of betrayal where the working class was very clear on what the problem was all along. Um, and I think left populism tried to craft the coalition between parts of the working class and parts of the professional class, both with Bernie um, and with the left populist movements such as Syriza, such as Podemos, or such as La France Assoumise in France. Um, but there's always a sense in which the cohabitation or the going together of those two groups is often very difficult. And in the end, the professional class ends up uh, on top of that coalition. And this proves difficult for um, the working class members of that coalition. Now, what I'd like to say, what at least was good about left populism. So what is valuable about left populism in the 2010s? Because I'm not interested in at all ridiculing its achievements or saying that it was all a waste of time. I think an enormously valuable work was done and I think everyone worked very hard for lessons which we can learn now. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that finally the left started asking some of the right questions or some better questions. Um, it starts to think more seriously about power. It starts to think more seriously about what the state is. Um, it's actually interested in economics and tries to understand what the world looks like in a concrete sense. Um, so you see no more changing the world without taking power, or if we can just occupy the square, we can get our demands pressed. Uh, finally, people say goodbye to all of this movementist 
stuff. And there's a clear intellectual departure from some of these very, very bad habits in the 2000s. Um, and the second point I'd like to make is similar insofar as we have a more intellectually developed left. Um, so I was discussing this recently with um, Vivek Chibber, who some of you might know, um, who's also a regular contributor to Jacobin, um, who said <clears throat> after the Corbyn defeat, um, I was telling him how miserable I felt and how painful this defeat was to take for me. And he said, uh, you have no idea how bad, bad the 1990s were. Um, how alone I felt politically, and just um, how little prospects I saw for mass Marxist politics in the 1990s. And he said, what's very clear is that you now have an intellectually more healthy and more interesting left that's as actually interested in the right questions. It doesn't necessarily have all the answers yet. The third really good thing about left populism I'd like to flag is that it was a really, really valuable exercise in agenda setting. Um, so many, many topics are finally uh, part of the political debate again. People are actually talking about Medicare for all uh, in Europe. The discussion about the merits of the European Union or the Eurozone is way more clear headed than it's ever been before. And I think some of this is actually to the credit of left populists who put these themes at the center of political debates. Now, of course, if you read political science uh, journals, you can tell that public opinion in no way means that public opinion will get enacted. So proposals which are very, very popular, popular in the general public, like Medicare for All, don't necessarily have a chance of getting enacted because they're popular. In fact, popularity often works against the feasibility or efficiency of those proposals. Um, but at least I think we can see a very, very sensitive and important shift in how uh, prominent parts of society actually dare to demand more. Um, there's just more ambition to make grander claims. This is in his essay as well, but in the early 2000s, when Joe Rogan was um, asked about his opinions on Medicare for All, he basically thought it was a crazy, uh, outlandish idea that would never get enacted in his lifetime. And now he was one of these prominent voices that actually came out for Bernie during the campaign. Um, and this shows that clearly something has moved. I wouldn't call it an Overton window but uh, the agenda on the left is certainly different. And I don't think we should neglect the fact that this has always been part of uh, socialist organizing. So if you look at the original German SPD, um, the original Social Democratic Party, they never actually treated elections as attempts to get into government. Uh, the idea was never actually to enter into a role where you could govern, the idea was to use elections as platforms where you could advertise certain ideas to make clear to people who haven't reached before what you were standing for, what your diagnosis of what was wrong with society was. And elections serve more as kind of advertising occasions rather than they did as um, selection procedures for governments. And so I think we shouldn't downplay in that aspect at all. And finally, the last thing I think which is good about less populism is that there was a real survey of the terrain and an attempt to find out who's available for something like a Bernie program and who will be difficult to reach. So we, we can clearly tell that part of suburban boomers um, and baby boomers who are a bit more middle class will find it very, very difficult to be won over for this. Uh, we can clearly see the same issue with pensioners as there was in Corbyn. Uh, but what Bernie shows is that there's a clear, clear section of the American Latino population that is incredibly on board with the Bernie program, uh, that is willing to be mobilized in the name of if its interests. And this is obviously we should keep, keep in mind for the future. Um, so I think by actually going into politics, both the Bernie campaign and the Corbyn campaign and left populism in Europe provided a kind of mapping of a terrain that was previously invisible. So it wasn't very clear who was for what, how people regarded their own interests, but left populism actually did what you could call with a fancy word, a kind of cartography of a previously unexplored terrain, which wasn't done before. So that is all for the good things, which I think are still considerable, but then I'd like to move to the, to the downsides. Um, and I think you can split the downsides in two ways, that left populism again was too populist and it was also too left. Um, and let me explain first what I mean with too populist. Um, I think left populism was too populist insofar as it accepted the void or it accepted the fact of demobilization to a heavy degree and thought that politics mainly had to happen on that level of the media and sometimes too heavily on the level of social media. 
Um, so it found it difficult sometimes to relate to big surviving working class institutions. For example, Podemos in Spain found it very difficult to come clear on what its relationship to the unions was. Um, and at the same time, it focused very heavily on media outreach and among a sort of politically active uh, young population. The problem is that if you focus very heavily on the media, you not only take demobilization for uh, granted, but it also makes you a hostage to the whims of a media class, um, which has specific incentives on how politics is about to function. So media classes are obviously also operating on a market. They have to sell their media products uh, to survive. And this means that um, you can't fully, um, it's not just like um, a sea which you can navigate at your ease. It's a very, very stormy environment which has its own logics. And as long as you don't move out of this kind of media environment, it will be more difficult to build the coalition you want to build. Um, and this <clears throat> leads me to my second point in which left populism was too populist, um, is that it also did not rebuild those kind of shop floor or um, working class institutions, which would create real social power. So the left was very much interested in political power, it was interested in moving to the level of the state, but there's no sense in which it was building a left-wing civil society that could support Bernie once he was in uh, government. So Bernie himself said this, I'm going to be an organizer in chief, not just a leader in chief. Um, but there was a difficult sense in which left populism didn't take seriously what it would mean to organize for Bernie so he could actually have uh, enough pressure at his disposal if he got into office. Uh, this was very clear with Syriza in Greece, which tried to stop a European austerity program and which then was faced with a showdown with the European authorities, but which couldn't actually mobilize the right forces within Greek society to actually go for an exit or to force the entirety of Europe to accept these proposals. Um, so what institutions are going to support your program and how are they going to support it? Now, I don't think we need to pretend we're in the early 20th century um, and we're educating illiterate Italian peasants who, uh, who don't know how to read. So we shouldn't romanticize this notion of a left-wing civil society. But it's just very, very hard to build political power if you don't have class power before that. Um, so there's a danger of putting the cart before the wheel, um, as in the most of cases. Then the second point <clears throat> on which I'd like to finish is that in what way was left populism too left? Um, and I think it was too left in two ways. Um, it was not open enough to people who had moved away from some of these old parties and some of these old institutions, which had just become career vehicles. So the left was uh, not open enough to the risk taking and the dealignment that was taking place in parts of the population. I think the classic example of this is Corbyn's relationship to the Brexit vote. So here you saw a group of people that was willing to take a risk and not follow what capital was telling them to do, namely to vote for them to stay in the European Union. There was obviously allying with a part of the right that was quite dangerous and quite quirky, but which clearly also um, Im implied in that population a certain degree of economic and redistributive ambition. But because um, it was supposedly not done by the right people and because it was too economically risky, Corbyn couldn't actually come up with a proper response to these people who had moved away from the Tories uh, in that specific way. Um, so Corbynism kind of missed its appointment with history because it couldn't read the willingness for risk taking and the ability for people to engage in a different form of politics uh, as it was before. And the second sense in which left populism was too left, I think, is um, it was left in a very cultural sense or in a subcultural sense as well. Um, so obviously, one of the illusions we should get rid of is that everyone needs to be in the left-wing tent or that the left can accommodate everyone in its coalition. Um, you have to be far more class-based about this and say, like, look, we're uh, trying to build a party of the workers. They're just part of the coalition that shouldn't be at the center of it. Um, that's the more dangerous form of populism you see in some cases. But we also can't look for what you could call chemically pure uh, political subjects. Um, there is no sense in looking for a perfect working class that um, doesn't have uh, prejudices, that doesn't have uh, completely misconceived preconceptions about how the world works. And it's often said that the workers who actually started the, the October Revolution in Russia were also, unfortunately, some of them were sexist, some of them were anti-Semites, 
uh, what happened is that they were enrolled in a political process which actually allowed them to interrogate some of those opinions uh, and allow them to build something that in the end might have resembled a better world. And I think <clears throat> this purism is a problem insofar as it gives you a very, very stringent uh, idea of who counts as your coalition and makes it difficult for you to look past um, some of these uh, cultural differences. And I think the main takeaway uh, for left populism as we're uh, entering the next phase of the COVID crisis is really thinking about transitions. So as I said, some things were definitely achieved. How can we preserve and consolidate those achievements in the coming decade? And how can this be done in the context of this new confinement capitalism or this new COVID capitalism that's being built? Um, and I think if you look at the UK, it's a pretty ill omen for what awaits you if you don't prepare for this transition, because Keir Starmer is now in charge of the Labour Party. He's basically put a large part of the old Blairite establishment back in charge. And he has taken on part of the radicalism of Corbyn. He's definitely moved to the left economically. But it's very clear that he's not up for the task of doing real uh, opposition towards the Tories. And it's very clear that the Tories are very, very curious and interested in parts of Labour's remaining working class base. So this shows that if you liquidate yourself into this party and you don't have an independent institution which can support your criticism of it, um, the left just becomes a kind of non-functioning job scheme of graduates who are desperate, desperate to get some kind of job. Um, and I think you can see this very clearly with things such as Navara and other uh, Corbynite media now, is that they're cozying up to Starmer because they desperately want to retain some sense of security and some sense of voice within their coalition, when it's very clear that the coalition is not um, friendly or hospitable to them at all. So I think the American question is, who is going to carry the torch, given that uh, politics has become so much about leaders? So if you don't have mass organization, politics is bound to be about leaders. So the question is, uh, if we're stuck with leaders, which leaders can you really trust uh, to carry on and which leaders will carry you into next epoch and preserve the gains of the Burmese moment? Um, and at the same time, the COVID crisis is reshuffling politics very, very fast. Um, there are some real tectonic movements that are happening under the surface. And the left should <clears throat> make sure it doesn't fall between the cracks um, insofar as things are moving. But if you're not moving in the right direction with them, there's a chance that you might actually fall between these precipices. Um, and again, the metaphor of the mountain is important insofar as once you have a sense of just how high the peak is and how steep the climb is going to be, you can prepare yourself better, but you still have to keep your eyes um, on the top of the mountain. I don't think you should settle for anything in the valley or anything in the bushes at the beginning. Um, but that is all I will say on the matter for now. And I'm very interested in uh, hearing what your questions are. Thank you, Anton. Before we turn it over to questions, um, which we have a number of questions in the chat that I've been collecting uh, throughout Anton's talk, uh, we're going to turn it over to Dino. Um, to, to give his uh, lecture on uh, third parties and whatever else he wants to say. Thanks, Chris. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Thanks, everybody. And Anton, thanks for um, your, your writing and, and that talk. I think that Anton's work is, is really important for sort of understanding the moment we're in. He's one of the few people who's really kind of taking seriously this question of populism and, and you know, what happened in these last five years. And for my part, I think on the American side of things, I think we can look at what happened and the achievements that we've made in the last five years, which I genuinely do think was a sort of compression of history, right? I think that we've seen a remarkable amount of uh, gains in a very short period of time. So the way I was talk I had talked about this before is to say that about a half century of socialist progress had been made in the five years of Sandersism. Now, what does that mean, right? A lot of people talk, and you heard Anton mention it somewhat um, despairingly, a lot of people talk about the Overton window. And, oh, well, Sandersism's chief achievement is that he moved the Overton window. And this is a political idea that sort of dates back to around when uh, libertarianism was first starting up as a, a political movement in the United States. And the idea was basically that the way to get things done is to enforce, is to sort of bring the edges of political conversation in your direction. So if this is the window and you're over here, 
you want to move everything such that you're inside the Overton window. And people talk about this as Sanders' big achievement. I'm not sure there's any real value to that. And I'll get into why later in the talk. But I think it's important to note that the achievements of Overton window media framing are very fickle. And people's voters' opinions can change very quickly about any given topic. And so in one election, you can see huge majorities for a certain issue. And then in the next election, those majorities can evaporate. So in my opinion, let's, we shouldn't be too rosy about the fact that people really like social democratic demands right now, unless we can organize off of it. So that's the first point I want to make. The second thing I want to say is that what I think the Sanders campaign gave us more than anything else was a field experiment and a crash course in mass politics. The past half century or so has seen socialists be completely detached from political practice entirely. Most socialists, numerically, anybody who really was interested in Marxism or socialism or class struggle, they lived in the campuses. They lived in universities. They were academics. They were intellectuals. They were activists. But they certainly weren't engaged in any kind of mass political project. And what the Sanders phenomenon did was it put us right in the center of the most important election in the world, right? The election for the president of the United States of America. And it forced socialists and socialist people who have socialist ideas to engage with ordinary people on a level and on a scale that had never been done before. It also forced us to reckon with what politics really is, which is not this pristine, you know, platonic version of ideas being thrown up and debated and the best ideas coming out the winners, right? What politics is, is a lot of dirty tricks, lying and smearing. And despite your best efforts, despite your attempts to really challenge uh, what politics is currently, you have to deal in that environment. And so that crash course taught us that people who are on the progressive left, like Elizabeth Warren, are not going to drop out and endorse Bernie Sanders, even though we all thought that she would, right? And we also learned that the Democratic Party is not going to shoot itself in the foot just to stop Bernie Sanders. They would never put somebody like Biden against Trump. Well, of course they would, right? So these were political lessons that I think we learned in this really short period of time that we hadn't had a chance to learn previously as, a, as a, an American left. And so that reunification of socialist politics with political practice is to me the biggest achievement of the Sanders moment, right? Suddenly, socialists are not these curiosities in the campuses indoctrinating the youth. They are a real political group, right? They're a legitimate claim to political action. But we haven't yet unified socialist politics with the working class. And we're going to get into all the challenges to making that happen. So while we've really attached socialism to politics in a national, major, and important institutional way, we haven't attached socialism to the class basis, which it is for, right? The socialist, socialist politics is for the working class, uh, but right now it is not of the working class. And I think that's going to be the chief challenge going forward. So after the Sanders phenomenon, the first thing that started happening on the left, which was predictable, and anybody could have seen this, because whenever you lose, this happens, immediately things started going haywire, right? On all sides of the political left, a group, group that had been once disciplined by the rigor of a, of a national election started splintering like crazy, and there were a million different wacky proposals for what we're going to do next. So I want to go through some of those and some of those pitfalls and, and show what I think are ultimately dead ends for us and things that we need to avoid. So the first is the most obvious, and it's the one that I think we hear a lot about on Twitter, though it's the least popular in any real sense, which is sectarianism or third partyism. And this is the idea that, well, it was clear that we failed utterly to win the presidency of the United States, which means we should go right back to running third party candidates that get 1% of the vote and spending all of our time, you know, trumpeting X or Y minor candidate because they won a city council seat or because they became dog catcher on a third party line. To me, it's a dead end no matter what, right? We have a political system, and I think you guys all read um, the article that I wrote on why third parties are incapable of breaking through, but we have a political system that necessitates the need for a mass constituency if you're going to challenge anything on the level of the major parties. And no third party can actually generate a mass constituency because 
they're perpetually doomed to spoiling elections and or being, you know, basically curiosities. So voters are never going to really be interested in them. And it's hard to generate a constituency if your basic claim to fame is losing, right? And it's, you know, as I say in the article, it's right there in the name. Third parties are the distant bronze medalists of American politics. And that's how most voters see them. They see them as essentially uh, incapable of influencing politics. So that's one thing I think we need to avoid, third partyism. We also need to avoid uh, subculturalism, which is a retreat back into a kind of campus, elite campus culture of sort of obscurantist left-wing politics, uh, philosophical politics, all that kind of stuff, in, in, which divorces ourselves from the actual political practice of winning people over to a, a socialist program. And that kind of politics, I think, was very dominant um, in the United States among socialists in particular, not necessarily among activists, but among socialists in particular. The uh, creating a kind of subculture was a very important part of maintaining the, uh, the socialist flame. And I think it's something that we have to avoid. The truth is that if we're going to attract most ordinary people, the majority of, of working class Americans, we simply can't retreat into enclaves of pure socialism, right? That's, it's a very bad way of attracting new uh, adherents to a political movement is to look as off-putting as most subcultural movements do. And the third uh, pitfall that I want to warn against is what Anton mentioned, which is called movementism. And movementism is the belief that we have to sort of tail every uh, protest movement and every protest movement is going to have a spark and that spark is going to ignite, ignite the next big mass movement and, we, and we have to be at the front of it. And this kind of movementism was very popular in the 1990s among activists. And it was basically, you know, a substitute for political practice. It was a way for lonely, uh, I don't mean that psychologically, I mean politically, politically lonely groups of left-wingers to justify their existence, right? You go to a protest, you feel like you've done something, like you've made a stand, you've done all this kind of activism. But as a political practice on a mass, large scale, it's really limited. And it can win some concessions here and there, especially on the very local level with certain Congress per persons, et cetera, et cetera. But it certainly cannot get a majority of people interested in the kind of politics you want them to be interested in. Because so protests, social protests work best when they are fighting against a very narrow set of issues. They don't work best when they are articulating a vision for a whole society. And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. So these are the three big um, pitfalls on the left that we have to avoid. These are the left-wing pitfalls. Now, the three pitfalls on the right are electoralism, first and foremost. And this is going to sound weird coming from me because I'm one of the biggest proponents of the left being involved in uh, elections. But I do think there is a danger for some, from some on the left of seeing our prospects as tied up with winning the next election. And if we don't win the next election, then we're failing as a uh, an organization and as a movement to build a constituency of the working class. And that logic, that instrumental logic of elections, suggests that if you can't win the next election, then you are failing. But the truth is, and this is something that we have to be aware of, building a constituency takes time. And it takes a lot more than just running candidates for election and ensuring that they do all the right you know, metrics and they meet all the goals that the existing electoral apparatus says are important. And it means building up institutional strength in the unions. It means building up uh, basic civil society organizations that no longer really exist. And it means doing a lot of the type of campaigning that happens in between elections to build a, an organization, right? So the challenge with electoralism is it immediately pushes you in a direction of trying to win the next election by any means necessary, right? And that often means watering down your program, seeking out a base that you don't exactly want, right? Like professional suburban middle-class um, whites, which is who are the people who predominantly vote. And it means using metrics and media that uh, aren't exactly how you change politics, right? They are ways of winning elections, certainly, but they're not exactly how you change the debate. And so this leads into the next, the second pitfall on our right, which is the suburban road to social democracy. And this is the, the kind of vision that I think uh, this guy, Sean McElwee, is, is most famous for promoting and data for progress, right? And basically what they said was, look, Bernie failed to get the working class on board with his program. He didn't expand the electorate. He wasn't able to actually pull blue collar workers into his coalition. Those people voted for Biden. 
Why do we care about them anymore? And McElwee is famous for sort of flagrantly saying we shouldn't care about the working class, right? And the challenge with this is that they actually can win elections. The suburban, the suburban progressives are going to win more elections than we are. And that's something that's hard to swallow because their task is much easier. They're saying politics is a middle class person's game. Why bother with those working class people? Let's focus on the suburban professionals, bring them in. After all, those people are probably more liberal than the workers anyway. And we can win a few congressional elections here and there. But there are two major problems with this. One, the first problem with, with it is the sort of moral abomination of saying, let's give up on 70% of the country. But the second problem with it from a strategic angle is that what they're essentially doing is incapable of actually influencing national politics. Because if you're the Democratic establishment and you look at an ultra blue district, and in an ultra blue district, somebody like Ayanna Presley is elected, right? And she's elected by largely post-college educated, uh, post-graduate educated, upper middle class, 100K a year salary voters. What interest do you have in changing your appeals, right? Essentially what the Democratic Party looks at and says, great. Don't get it? Ayanna Presley won an election among an ultra blue district that we were never going to lose that election in any way. Fantastic. And you're saying you're validating the Democratic establishment strategy of winning among suburban voters, right? The Democratic establishment has been very clear that their entire strategy is to focus on the suburbs and to focus on winning suburban congressional seats. If we say that's our strategy too, guess what? They're gonna eat our lunch. They are going, they're far better funded. They are far better, they have more media connections. They're gonna win those elections. And if we do win those elections, we have no leverage over them. This is one reason why the blue dog Democrats who were able to steal Republican seats had so much more leverage in the party than the AOCs do contemporarily. Because the blue dog Democrats had something over the party head, right? They said, look, we can win elections against Republicans. You guys can't. And so the Democratic Party had to listen to them. And the Democratic Party moved dramatically to the right to listen to them. If we can't win elections, general elections against Republicans, there's absolutely no reason why people should care about socialist politics. So we have to avoid the suburban road to social democracy, which to me is a dead end right off the start. And finally, we have to avoid what's, you know, what we understand from the 1990s as kind of NGO anti-politics. The, the insistence on charity, on building up nonprofit organizations, and on you know, doing a lot of media work around how bad the system is and how bad things really are. To me, this is fundamentally an anti-political way of, of operating. People know things are bad. You know, people know that they, their paychecks haven't been growing. They know that they don't have health care. Constantly exposing it and using various nonprofits to show how, just how bad it really is doesn't do much for, from a political perspective. Really what it does is it makes you look weak and whiny. It doesn't make you look like a political leader. It makes you look kind of like a, a weak uh, set of media liberal, uh, bleeding heart liberals who nobody really wants to be involved in. And that's been the, the trajectory of the nonprofit liberal sector with fewer and fewer members involved in that whole world since the 1990s, but more and more cash that they sort of gobble up from the big foundations. And so in terms of the overall pitfalls, we have, you know, to use the song, there are clowns to the left of us who are insisting on third partyism, subculturalism, and uh, movementism. And there are jokers to the right of us who are insisting on winning the immediate next election through suburban politics and big NGOs and charities. So both of these visions, I think, are bad. And we, and we have to avoid them, especially as a socialist left. It's going to be hard to avoid them because those people are going to be on TV more than us. And they're going to be getting a lot more attention than us on Twitter and social media. But I think, nonetheless, we should try to avoid them. Now, I want to move into what are our sort of big structural and instrumental constraints going into the next period. And I think these are threefold. One is ideological, one is organizational, and one is fundamentally political. So the, ideo the biggest ideological constraint that the socialist left in the United States faces right now is identitarianism or identity politics. And it's the thing that I think the socialist movement needs to move the quickest away from and to get over the quickest. And it's hard. It's a very difficult sort of tough terrain to get around, right? It's laden with moral language. It is a way of appealing to a certain type of moral sympathy and, and being sort of rough on it 
has really strong consequences, especially if you're in media or in, in any kind of uh, profession where writing and speaking are important parts of your, your life. But it's a dead end for us politically, and it's a dead end on a number of levels. I'm not sure if people saw the recent polling around Biden, but the only people, the only group of people who care that Biden is a white man are upper class whites, whites that make over $100,000 a year. Every other demographic group, especially blacks and Latinos, couldn't care less that he's a white man. And yet, if you listen to progressive media, this is the single most important thing. This is the single most important thing that Biden's going to have trouble because he's not a diversity candidate. It's just not true among the actual, you know, demographics of the country. It's just, there's no evidence for it whatsoever. But among a certain set of largely white professional class people, this is the most important political issue. And there's a reason for it, right? And the reason for it is because it is a way of displacing class politics. It's a way of displacing the narrative around a working class agenda that's a redistributive agenda and that insists that, yeah, people are going to have to get, even upper middle class people are going to have to get taxed if we're going to get Medicare for all, right? Yeah, you're going to have to sacrifice some things. And part of that sacrifice for the professional class is being arm in arm in a political movement with somebody that you maybe find uh, distasteful or unfashionable because they don't have a, a college education, right? And so I think for these reasons, the professional class insists on the identity stuff. They insist on the idea that this is the most important thing. And I, we have to focus so much on demographics. But again, even in their own vision of this world, the, high, the idea behind identity politics is if you can prove to certain demographic sectors that you care about them, you can capture their votes. The largest racial and ethnic minority in this country is Latino voters, right? They're absolutely massive. And one reason why Sanders was criticized really early on for not being open enough on immigration, right? He said he wasn't for open borders and lots of people in the left-wing media world lost their minds. How dare he say that? He's going to lose every Latino vote. Well, it turns out that in the exit polling among Latino voters, who were Sanders' biggest minority demographic by a long shot, immigra immigration showed up fifth among issues that Latino voters care about. Huge majorities of Latino voters said their first, their number one priority was, and this might shock everybody, healthcare. Number two, jobs. Number three, education. And these are majorities, I'm talking 60, 70% of Latino voters said these are the most important things. Only 25 to 30% of Latinos said immigration was the most important thing in the presidential election. Those Latinos were also the college educated, high income Latinos that said immigration was the most important thing. So ideologically, we have to shed this idea that identity politics and the excessive woke uh, sort of signaling that happens in the left media and happens on, on you know, progressive channels and everything like this is the path to the future. It's simply not. It is a constraint on working class politics. It's actually something that many workers find distasteful and many workers find alienating. And I think we have to get over that idea. And basically, we don't have to do much different than what we used to do. The kind of language that appeals to most people is the kind of things that Bayard Rustin and Martin Luther King used to say, which is that you should have Medicare for all regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of your creed, regardless of your religion, regardless of where you live, regardless of your job. That kind of inclusive universal language is popular among all people. It's the exclusivist language that gets people into trouble. So this is our first sort of uh, ideological hurdle, is the identity issue. Now, the next, the next hurdle is organizational. And Anton touched on this a bit. The biggest hurdle we have organizationally is that the American working class is fundamentally disorganized. And it is so remarkably disorganized that not only do we have incredibly low union density, but even in our party politics, we're incapable of coming to any sort of consensus, right? So in any organized fashion of, of the political left, we would have been able to say to Elizabeth Warren, as soon as Iowa wrapped up, you have to drop out. And she would have dropped out. And then there would have been some chance that Sanders could have picked up some more delegates and been more of a viable contender going later into the, uh, the stages of the presidential campaign. Instead of that, because the progressive movement is totally disorganized, because there's no real working class to discipline it, no organized working class to discipline it, Elizabeth Warren could freelance all she wants, and she could coast her way all the way through Super Tuesday and beyond, and no one could tell her to stop, right? On the flip side of that, you see how well organized the establishment is. They are 
incredibly well organized, so well organized that they took two very promising candidates and they forced them out of the race as soon as possible in order to consolidate around Joe Biden. So you have the disorganization of the working class on one hand and the hyper organization of the party elite on the other hand. And this brings us to the, the third big constraint, which is the political one. And this is fundamentally that the Democratic Party is popular among Democrats, and it's something that we have to deal with. The fact that we don't like the Democratic Party elite doesn't change the fact that the Democratic voters, by and large, prefer their party elite to the Republican Party. Politically, we have to show that we are a better alternative to beating the Republicans than they are, right? And I hope that in the coming years, we can demonstrate that they're incapable of actually challenging Republican rule. But for the most part, most rank and file Democrats are going to side with the party establishment over the insurgency because the insurgency hasn't proved itself. And that's the political challenge that we have to meet. Now, these all sound really difficult to get overcome, but I think there are three huge, huge opportunities uh, along these three same axes that we can build on. So the first is the triumph of democratic socialism as an ideological vision. And this cannot be understated because in, a, in the United States following the Cold War, anything with the S word attached to it was a death knell. And yet today, it is a normal way of classifying yourself. It is a normal way of identifying. And that cannot be more important. And I think this is one place where we actually have a leg up over our European friends is that socialism actually has a meaning to it right? Populism can really mean a lot of different things, but socialism has a meaning and ordinary people associate socialism with a particular thing. And that happens to not be the gulag today. It happens to be Sweden and Norway, right? Now we may say, oh, that, well, that's not quite socialism, it's social democracy, blah, 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 blah. So who cares? The fact is that they're associating socialism with a higher standard of living, a highly organized working class, and a planning, a level of planning in the economy that the United States has never, ever had before. And if they are associating it with that positively, that, that's just an unbelievable level of achievement for us. And I think it's something that we, we still have yet to grasp how important that is. So ideologically, breaking through as democratic socialists has been a huge, huge boon to us. And we have to take that and run with it. Organizationally, DSA has grown dramatically and a number of other organizations have grown that have built what I think is not quite a party surrogate, right? We're not there yet. I don't think that we have enough union support. I don't think that we're big enough to call ourselves like a party surrogate. We certainly can't discipline our own candidates, right? But what we have become is a connective tissue for the left. So DSA operates as a sort of nodal organization that can pull in unions, it can pull in community organizations, it can pull in candidates and act with a, a strong ideological vision as the organization that is behind much of what made up the progressive movement in, in the past. That connective tissue hopefully congeals into a really strong muscle, right? And that's organizationally where we can grow, right? If we can build real links, especially with the labor movement, especially with the union movement, build real durable links with the labor movement such that we can become something like a political arm of certain local unions and a political arm of certain local labor federations, we can actually become a much more powerful organization in civil society than the socialist movement has been in a hundred years. And I think in the coming five years, it will be a test of whether or not we can, we can do that. And then finally, the biggest political opportunity we have is Medicare for all. So as the coronavirus crisis has really sort of destroyed American society, destroyed the American economy, the biggest thing it has shown is that having a totally uncoordinated private healthcare system is absolutely incapable of solving the collective problems of something like a pandemic. And if you have collective problems in public health, which you're always going to have, and they're only going to get worse, then you can't have private solutions. Most Americans see that today. They see it even more now than they did when Bernie was in the race. And I think that politically, our opportunity is to see Medicare for all as a post-corona reform, right? If the Great Depression was able to give us Social Security, right, which came on the backs of decades of labor organizing and all that, then coronavirus could actually give us Medicare for all. Only if we seize that opportunity and take it politically. But it could be the catalyst to get us in a place where we can force Democrats to say, okay, it's time. Okay, it's time that we break with the private insurers who've caused mass death 
and we actually institute something like a public health care system in this country. And it's a matter of national security at this point, right? You cannot have a public, a private system that is essentially denying care to millions and millions of people just because they can't make enough money off of it. So I think politically, op the political opportunity for us right now is still Medicare for All. It is the horizon. It is the most important single political achievement that we can make as leftists right now. All right. So finally, I want to talk to wrap up about the future. And I think that the, the future is something that, you know, we have some say in, but given our, our weakness and our, our size, it's also something that's going to be happening without us. So what I'm really worried about, and I hope all of you in the, in the Q&A can dissuade me from being worried about this, is that right now I see two paths in the Democratic Party opening up for elected uh, congressional officials in particular. And the one path is what we're seeing in, in Biden, right? And Biden is somebody who is conservative on economic issues, and he's also conservative on cultural issues. He's just conservative. He's essentially a left-wing Republican, right? And the case to be made about Biden in the 2020 primary was that that is the definition of electability. Being a conservative is being electable, right? Now, on the left side of the, the field, what, I've, what we've seen open up, which worries me, is that the kind of inherits, the inheritors of Sandersism are not really very like Sanders. And this is to say that Sanders always had crossover appeal. He was always able to actually win Republican voters and win um, nonpartisan voters to his agenda. And the main reason why is because, you know, as David Frum sort of aptly identified, he was left, but he wasn't woke, right? He didn't, he had very strong left-wing views, but he didn't really dabble in, in uh, kind of uh, uh, the, what, what people call woke culture wars, right? Now, my fear is that the left wing of the Democratic Party right now is left and woke, while the right wing of the Democratic Party is not left and not woke. Well, to me, that means that the Democratic Party isn't going to win any elections. Because if your left wing political program, if your left wing economic program is tied with an alienating uh, cultural program, like Elizabeth Warren, for instance, who at one point on the campaign trail insisted that a nine-year-old would have veto power over the Secretary of ed Education in order to prove that she cared about um, transgender people, which is just mind-blowingly stupid and out of touch with how ordinary people think about the world. If that's the way that you think the world should operate, you're not going to win any trust among ordinary people. Right. And then on the other side of the program, if you're Joe Biden and you're, you're able to, you know, flout all of these woke culture war conventions, but your economic program essentially consists of Obama, but worse, you're not going to win working class voters into your coalition. And so these two paths for the Democratic Party, again, going back to McElwee, are both paths for the professional class. Right. One path, the woke, but the woke and left path is the D class professionals who are, you know, struggling with their income situation and their, their class situation. So they're willing to accept a left-wing economic program, but given their elite educations and largely confined to um, a certain campus culture, they're obsessed with a certain type of rhetorical style that is alienating to most working people. And then the other side is basically their parents who don't have any conception of what working class life is and just assume that all workers are conservative. And because they are comfortable themselves, don't have any interest in a left-wing redistributive economic program. So they think somebody like Biden appeals to the, the blue collar uh, lunch pail type because they imagine that working class people are fundamentally bigots and conservative flag wavers, right? Both of these paths are paths that the Democratic Party is actively pursuing, and both are total dead ends. They're electoral dead ends, they're political dead ends, they're ideological dead ends. And I think we have to be able to see that that division is opening up in the party, and it's a division that we have to somehow avoid, right? We need to strike a path that is able to actually have a left-wing economic program, but speak and have a mainstream appeal, not sound uh, sort of alienating in the way that many, many of the campus left do. And so finally, I think that the opportunity we have is that there is an emerging political majority of the working class, and this is new. And this is to say that politically, the working class has always been sort of, um, in this country, has always been all over the map ideologically, right? It's one of the sort of things that political scientists always remark upon. But that's starting to change. And it, it changed in the 1930s, and it's starting to change again, which is to say that most workers, even though many of them don't vote, they do have a program, and that program looks a lot like Bernie Sanders' program, right? They understand that we cannot continue to have a political uh, organization that is incapable of meeting the needs of most American voters and most American workers. And so that working class majority that is forming politically 
is something that we have to graft onto and we have to be a part of and we have to mold in order for them to see that democratic socialism is a viable political future. So I'll end it there. I'm sure there are lots of um, questions and condemnations of everything I've said, and hopefully we can get to that in a short bit. Uh, thank you, Dino. We do have a lot of questions um, that we may not be able to get to uh, in this portion of, of our event, but I encourage for anyone who's asked a question that we're not able to handle uh, right now, that you bring that up in your small group discussions. Um, so to start, since um, you know Anton's presentation uh, was first, um, I was able to gather um, the questions that came up with, with his uh, presentation first. Um, and we, we had our first question from uh, Miko, who um, asked to hear more about how broad the Progressive Socialist Coalition might be. Um, are there Elizabeth Warren PMC types likely to support our key demands? Um, and this seems like a question that could be appropriate for both of you to answer. You're muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, on the broadness of the coalition, and I guess this ties into some of the PMC debates that have been raging on the left uh, of late. Um, and as I said, I don't think everyone should belong to the left. As I think this is an illusion of PR politics generated the idea that there are no sociological groups that should be excluded from your coalition. At the same time, I think the key question here is internal hierarchy. So obviously part of the professional class post 2008 is finding itself in a structural position that seems very, very similar to, a, to working class people. So when your employment prospects are decimated, when you're faced with skyrocketing rents, when there's just no way for you to get on the housing ladder like your parents did. It, it just looks as if you're naturally in the same boat as what working class people have been going, on, going through for a long time. I think the key question is though that um, there's, there are still cultural differences which are abiding and which might cause alienation between those two groups. So that will create a tension that might be dangerous. But it's still also, and I think you can clearly see this with Corbynism, Corbynism relied on this alliance between downwardly mobile professionals and some of the peripheral northern working classes. But clearly the internal hierarchy of Corbynism relied on those professionals being in charge. They were at the, in the driver's seat, their priorities came first, and the working class um, was given all kinds of uh, gifts. It was given a laundry list of different proposals, but in many ways it was not taken seriously. And Brexit was a key expression of this where it was easier to convince middle-class Londoners of the necessity of Brexit than it was to convince Northern working classes of the necessity of Remain. Because the democratic case for Brexit was clear because there was a majority, majority for this particular petition, uh, position on the referendum. Still, because of the predominance of these groups within the Labour coalition, they were able to press through the idea that there needed to be a second referendum and that Brexit was never going to happen. And this alienated a large part of that other coalition. And this really highlights this internal hierarchy problem because it shows like these two groups will have to live together uh, within a social democratic coalition. You need uh, higher educated and well-educated people, certainly if you want to go to the government because you need the right kind of bureaucrats. But it is dangerous if you grant them a superior position within that coalition and you need to make them um, I mean, I don't want to say you, you need to make them scared. I think you need to make them understand that they don't come first in that coalition. Uh, they have a part, but they're not, in, they're not supposed to be in charge. They will get their uh, benefits, but I mean, maybe there will be, as Dustin said, there may be a question of taxes. Maybe when it comes to flexible labor contracts, they'll have to concede to some of the amounts that are made by other parts of the coalition. And if you don't maintain this sense of internal hierarchy, you can quickly, uh, yeah, you can, you can lose a political battle pretty quickly, as Corbynism shows in a very uh, miserable way, I'd say. <clears throat> Thank you, Anton. Dustin, do you want to take up that question, or um, I can pose another question for you? Oh, sorry. You're unmuted. Yeah, so I, I, Anton and I have actually been talking about this quite a bit, and this question of the PMC and the relationship to the working class. And I think my own feeling about this, and this is gonna be very crude, but I think it's something that um, we should all think about it in terms of the strategy. Uh, Middle-class voters 
essentially want power. They're essentially interested in picking a winner. That's the thing that they really want to do in, in politics. And our challenge is organizing workers into, into American politics because middle class people have always voted. Uh, they've always been somewhat liberal in this country for, well, they've been somewhat liberal in this country since the 1970s. And they, they have a really strong influence on the media in particular. It's working class people who are left out of the political situation entirely. And I think that we need to focus on bringing working class people into the coalition. And it's the, the idea that um, the, there's a, a sort of real negotiation between the classes is kind of a, a, a way of thinking about it as if these classes have individual representatives that negotiate some kind of treaty. The reality is, unless you have a majority of your coalition being um, working class, fundamentally working class, the middle class is going to exercise outsized influence because they, have, they largely have the media. And that's the biggest thing that uh, the media is pitched to upper middle class people. Political media is fundamentally pitched to upper middle class voters. That's, that's who the media class is pitching their arguments to. And so if you don't have a majority of working class voters on your side, it's really hard to push back against the, uh, the strength of the upper middle class in their, in their political appeals. Uh, so sort of a related question that is coming up in the chat um, is a lot about identity politics, um, which is is obviously, you know, a, a, a touchy subject, um, but it's a very important one. And I think it's related to this question about um, the PMC and how um, we kind of capitulate our demands to the, to the PMC um, and what um, what would appeal to them and their concerns. Um, so uh, it, it, it seems like many uh, people in the chat um, are somewhat critical of the framing of identity politics um, in too much of a negative light um, and are instead um, uh, arguing that, that uh, identity politics has been used as um, or has been weaponized um, as a way to disorganize the working class. Um, but is otherwise fine as a left strategic framework. Um, so the first question for that is just, you know, what do you guys think about that? Um, but then the second question that I think is um, definitely worth uh, bringing up here as well is what are the practical implications of abandoning a woke politics? Uh, and this question is coming from Lee. Um, she asked, does that mean that we neglect to take a stand on potentially controversial issues like immigration or Palestine, trans rights, sex work, et cetera, um, or do we simply, or simply that we highlight class politics when talking to a mainstream audience? Um, so I think that second question is very um, a good question to get at the concrete uh, of what this looks like um, in political terms. So either one of you can t take up that question. Anton, go ahead. Yeah, as, I mean, everyone knows this is a minefield. And um, I think the best way to approach it is you don't have to proclaim that you, <clears throat> how should I say, that you're not on the same side politically as the identitarians. And by that, I mean, on a lot of these issues, um, I think socialists agree, or they're, they're, they're as liberal as some of these opponents. Uh, there's an essential agreement uh, on issues such as trans rights, even when it comes to immigration, we can have uh, discussions about that. It's just what you give priority of what you grant political oxygen as a political actor. And um, so even if you're incredibly liberal yourself on these issues, you still might think this is not the right way to build a coalition. So that doesn't mean deprioritizing it or giving up on it or tolerating bigotry. It's more about saying like, um, what kind of coalition can you get together to enforce your demands? And what is the easiest way to keep that coalition together? And as that coalition is built along the way, maybe hope that some people will shed some of their problematic opinions. Um, and I, I think the issue with, you don't have to be anti-identitarian, you have to be kind of post-identitarian. So far as you say like, look, we care about these matters, but if we actually want the, the power to change things in this country, um, we might have to build our coalition on a different basis. Um, and this doesn't mean that you have to close your eyes to some of these thorny issues or um, that you have to 
acquiesce to bigotry, which can be very real in certain sectors of the population. But at the same time, if you grant these issues so much oxygen, and if you give a monopoly to this, um, of people who uh, control a certain academic language, who know the uh, jargon and who know the ins and outs of a particular discourse, then you're basically putting yourself on the back foot from the beginning. So it's not about being anti, it's more about saying, this is something we don't want to prioritize, although we think it's important in a different sense. <clears throat> Gotcha. Thanks, Carissa. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Anton put that very well and very eloquently and, um, you know, better than the, my crude Americanism. That's why, that's why we have these Belgians in here so that they can be polite and, and thoughtful about the way they approach these questions. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, the model is really the way that MLK and, and uh, Bayard Rustin talked at the, uh, you know, toward the end of the civil rights movement. The way they talked about identity questions and identity issues was fundamentally from a universalist perspective and a humanist perspective. From Rustin, it was a, a genuine socialist perspective and later MLK became more of a radical. But what they, what the way, the language they use and the rhetoric the rhetorical frame they use was that America should not be a place where anybody on the virtue of their ascriptive identities, right, their race, color, creed, nationality, blah, 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 blah uh, should be discriminated against, right? And that was the way that they approached their politics rhetorically. That is a language of majoritarian. It is a language of universal. It is a language of politics, right, on the basis of class. Now, the problem that I have with the current way in which many people, uh, talk about um, you know, identity issues today is that they actually focus on increasingly minority groups, right? Increasingly minoritarian groups. And the sort of virtue of the woke identitarian language is to pick the most sort of marginal group and highlight them as your number one political priority. And what this signals to most people who are not part of that group is that you're going to be a minoritarian lawmaker. And you know, democracy does not want you to be a minoritarian lawmaker. You're supposed to act on behalf of the majority. But if you're insisting on being the, the fighter for just particular minorities, most workers, including workers of that minority, are going to think that you're not fighting for the majority. And I think that's the challenge that we have to get over. Now, I think the, the left has done much better jobs at this in the height of civil rights which is kind of ironic, right? At the height of American Southern white supremacy was Why? when the left was at its best at constructing majoritarian arguments against racism. And I think we have to go back to the way in which we talked about politics from that era. Absolutely agree with Anton. There is, I do not know a single socialist who has reactionary views on these things. The, the question is one of priorities and rhetoric. It's not one of actual political principle. There's no, and I certainly would never say that we are abandoning any constituency group on principle. It's a question of how you talk about politics and how you, you sort of actually appeal to a mainstream majority. And I, and I think it's something that's it's hard. And I think the reason it's fraught and the reason people get high tensions about it, the reason people get upset about it is because it's a difficult thing to do. And it's probably the biggest uh, political and rhetorical challenge that we have on the left is making these decisions and how to actually politically communicate our ideas in a way that appeal to people without a college degree. And I think that's something that we have to take seriously. Yeah, thank you, Dino. Um, the uh, next question that I'll pose um, is, is not really a, a question, more of a comment, but I think it gets um, uh, strikes at something that may have been missing from uh, your piece, Dustin, uh, that we wanna make sure is very clear in your argument, even though you had you acknowledge in other places um, that uh, is kind of acting in the background of uh, this strategy of running a surrogate or building a surrogate party. Um, and it's a comment from uh, Mike Hirsch, uh, who's you know been on the left for a very long time, and he's a beloved member of our committee. Um, but um, he says that as, as sharp as Dustin's critique uh, is, he, he isn't going beyond a purely electoral perspective, regardless of which form he advocate, advocates. In, in, inside of inside or outside of the Democratic Party or operating as a regional party doesn't exhaust our mission. Uh, working class organization, regardless of an electoral or, uh, orientation, is key. 
the organization can't just be electorally oriented, but, but social movement oriented as well. Uh, we don't need just left voters. We need agitators in the workplace and community as well. Um, and you know, he acknowledges that that might be assumed in your piece, um, but it, it was missing um, explicitly. So if you wanna speak to that so we can make that clear. Yeah, Mike, thanks for that. And it's good to hear, hear uh, your, even though I didn't get to hear your voice, to read your, your words. Uh, I miss you, buddy. Um, the, uh, he's totally right. I mean, the, the pieces that I've written have been focused on the electoral dimension of socialist politics, which I think has been the dimension of socialist politics that has the, become the furthest in our uh, political practice, right? It's the, it's the piece that has gone from incredibly weak to actually having some potential for, for strength. Our, our working class organization on the shop floor is still very, 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 very weak and getting weaker and weaker. If you look at union density today, it's, it's a really harrowing thing. And, and I think socialists have every, you know, I myself, this is what my life is devoted to, is to organizing people on the shop floor. And I think that it's something that you need to, that we as socialists need to grapple with and something that we need to be doing as every part of our political practice. But the work that I have, I've written has focused on the electoral dimension. And yeah, I concede that, you know, for lack of, of space and time, I haven't been able to talk more about the, uh, the union side of things and the, the side of things that might be considered more on the, uh, the level of, of social organization and less on the level of, of election organization. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I have another clarifying question that I wanna uh, bring up for Anton, uh, and this is from Jason. Uh, he asks, could you explain the uniqueness of protest politics? It seems that protest politics differs from political protests of the mid century because it has no institutions. Is this because the protesters did not organize institutions or because institutions did not organize the protests? You're unmuted. Yeah, can you hear me? Um, I think you've basically summarized uh, or answered the question for me um, insofar as protest politics, um, like protest has always been a part of politics. I think what's specific about protest politics is that you elevate one specific part of a collection of political tactics to the only valid political tactic. And that's when protest in politics turns into protest politics. And as you say, like uh, middle of the century protests did lead to institutions or institutions led protests. What you now have is just an exclusive emphasis on what you call the performance of protest. So people just being uh, in public squares and showing that they care about a particular issue, but not actually thinking about what it would mean uh, to exercise power in a society or to exercise power in the state. And it's also because um, uh, protests can, of course, never be fully spontaneous, um, but protests rely on a, on a set of grievances or a set of feelings that are always very fleeting um, and that always unite a large number of people who don't necessarily uh, continue with these, uh, with these questions before. And I also, for example, want to be skeptical. Um, uh, if you look at something like the Arab revolutions in the early 2010s, which are obviously sold as successful protest revolutions. So people just gathered spontaneously in these large squares and then were able to press their demands on the state and actually brought these dictators down. Obviously it's a question of what happens afterwards. But here's an idea that protests can actually achieve real political gains. But if you actually see what happened in Egypt and what, see what happened in Tunisia is that most of these um, Arab revolutions started with strikes. Um, Egypt had a number of incredibly militant unions um, who were able to um, pose a threat to the state. And it was from within these factory strikes and from within these unions that social pressure actually went into uh, the squares and these, social, these unions actually formed the backbone of these, of these movements. Um, and so protest politics as something that is exclusively performative or just showing that you care or just creating a sense of togetherness between people uh, is unlikely to achieve anything. Um, and even where it seems that they achieved something, as in the Arab revolutions, it's clear that the backbone of those revolutions were still uh, class institutions. Um, and I think this is what's specific about new protest politics is that you presume that you don't need that backbone to actually get your results. <clears throat> Thank you, Anton. Um, next, I'm gonna ask a question that was uh, posed by our committee in preparation uh, for this talk. 
um, and uh, direct it towards Dustin. Um, so in your essay on third partyism, you highlight the history of ballot and district districting rules to explain the current state of the American party system and why it's uniquely prohibitive uh, to the emergence of a viable alternative party. And generally, one often hears uh, the complaint that the system, meaning merely the electoral system, is set up against the emergence of a true third party or any sort of alternative. Um, to, to what extent should socialists continue to concern themselves with challenging those electoral rules and technical measures that are designed to keep down progressive candidates? Um, and would developing a party surrogate make the technical barriers to winning state power for the left less of an issue? Okay, so um, I think it's two questions, right? One is, should the left use uh, democratizing reforms as part of its political program? And I think, you know, I've said this before, and I think it's a, it's a tricky issue. Yes, in a sense, the left should absolutely insist on democratizing the state, right, in some form or another. The, the barriers to political participation are incredibly great in this country, and it's one reason why workers don't vote. But I think at the end of the day, our political program is going, should be front-loaded with the kinds of demands that excite people, right? Changing multi multi-member district rules are not things that people really get excited about. They're kind of strange and arcane rules that are hard to generate excitement around because they're fundamentally legalistic and technocratic. But nonetheless, when socialists are in government and if socialists are to take a majority, they should absolutely try to democratize the state uh, in significant ways, ways that can actually generate greater um, participation in politics by the working class. On the other question as to whether a party surrogate alleviates some of the institutional concerns, it absolutely does, right? If we, if we said we wanted to run third party, we would have to meet all of these incredibly difficult ballot access laws and then we would have to face two parties in competition at once with an already minoritarian constituency. So if you just look at both the math and the logic of third party politics, you're, by running inside of a Democratic Party primary, you're eliminating one party altogether, right? We're not fighting the Republicans in Democratic Party primaries. And you're eliminating ballot access laws. So a, a party surrogate model running on the Democratic Party ballot line, but independent of the party's donors, is a model that alleviates many of the institutional constraints. But at the end of the day, the fundamental task, always, 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 in any political system, and for socialists anywhere, even in socialists who have uh, proportional systems, is organizing a majority constituency, right? We want to govern. We want to win the state to, to enact reforms. That means you have to have a majority on your side. And so regardless of what, whether we succeed in democratizing some parts of the state or whether we succeed in winning you know, big elections as Democratic primary opponents, the, the task is to win a majority, right? And the task is to have a majority for our candidates at all levels of government. So I think if you reframe the, the thinking in, in that way, in how do we win a majority, you start to think in terms more of what your political program looks like and how you actually reach a mass audience, and less in terms of, well, how do we tweak the state such that it becomes easier for us to run our candidates? Because our case needs to be made that we have to, be, we have to build a constituency. We have to build a constituency from nothing. And that is our challenge. And the institutional challenges can either hamper that goal, which I think they do in the case of third parties, or they can aid in, in accessing a mass constituency, which I think they do in terms of uh, party search. I think a follow-up question to that would be um, clarifying whether or not it would be enough um, or at least one part of our strategy as socialists to um, uh, in, in some way or another attempt to take over the Democratic Party, whether that be by getting someone, um, getting one of our people elected as uh, the chair of the DNC or in some strategic position of power where they can uh, theoretically influence uh, the rules and, um, you know, what, what dic dictates um, the party platform. Uh, could you uh, address that, that question? Thank you. So, um, yeah, and I would actually like to hear Anton's discussion on this in regards to the Labour Party in, in the UK, too, if he doesn't mind uh, replying, because in my opinion, our work is best in 
uh, in doing what socialists have traditionally called mass work. And that means avoiding elections for committee seats inside the Democratic Party. Because if people don't vote in primary elections, nobody gives a shit about your local Democratic Party county chair. And if our goal is reaching ordinary working class people, and that's our real political aim, then I think it's a, a lot of energy and a lot of uh, sort of time spent winning these party chair seats that really don't have a lot of influence. They seem like they have a lot of influence because they can change rules here and there, but they don't have a lot of influence in the sense that those positions are dictated by the majority of the party. They're dictated by the whims of how the party is going. So if you don't have a majority in the party, no matter how progressive you are as a party chair, you might be able to get some rules changed, et cetera, et cetera, but you're still going to be presiding over a fundamentally democratic, a fundamentally conservative democratic party. And that's the challenge that we have, which is until we can organize a large enough constituency to make the Democratic Party lose its shit, we, we, no matter how many times we make rules changes or how many times we're managed to get somebody on an important committee, it's, it's going to have very little impact on the trajectory of the party as a whole and the trajectory of how the party operates. So my own opinion is like, yes, if you can win those seats easily without a lot of effort, absolutely do it. You can definitely do some damage in terms of getting more people involved in the party process. But as a political strategy, it has its real limits. And I think our strategy should be mobilizing working class people into party primaries to win elections so that pe our people are actually in the state. They have power. They're actually people who can write laws. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Anton because I think he has, it's, it's a different perspective from uh, the UK, but I'm sure they're having a very similar debate in the Labour Party. Um, Anton, I'm actually, uh, I, would, I would love to hear your uh, answers to that question as well, but if you could also address the question of um, how then, the, what, alternatively, would we build a base that has, uh, and create a channel between that base uh, constituency and the people in power to then discipline those, um, uh, you know, politicians to fall in line with, with whatever it is as a base we decide they need to be doing. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Um, so <clears throat> on Dustin's specific question about the Labour Party, um, I think I broadly think um, the, the questions are very similar. Although the big difference is the UK is not a party state in the same way, um, insofar as the Labour Party is still a membership party, while it's clear that the Democrats have left that model a long time ago. Um, but I think, again, it's a question of how much effort it requires and how it influences your political priorities. Um, and what we saw in Labour is really, really desperate and long attempts to get all of the Corbynite figures within the right leadership positions within the party which obviously has its value because once you have complete institutional control of the party, it's easier, easier to run uh, elections and you also get rid of saboteurs. And obviously saboteurs were a big, big problem, um, as we can tell with those labor leaks insofar as um, in the December election, but also in 2017, there were active attempts on behalf of that old guard to actually sabotage Corbyn's attempts uh, to get a majority. So I think it's important, certainly in the context of labor, to get enough institutional power together. But if you focus only on achieving those leadership positions, which is a lot of work mainly internally, um, rather than building a larger social base at the bottom of the party, um, then there's a danger that you just uh, end up, well, you end up placing people in power who then don't really have a base to rely on. So what we saw with momentum uh, within Labour is that they did immense attempts to get all of their candidates within the right local uh, um, Labour Party uh, councils as well, which took a lot of work and which apparently also involved a large degree of confrontation between Momentum, which was mainly London-based, and then Labour parties, which might have had a more local uh, tradition. Instead of actually trying to build Momentum into a real civil society um, uh, institution that could actually uh, get a more solid base of Labour voters on board. So again, it's a question of priorities insofar as where do you want to allocate all your resources? Do you want to build, um, do a very, very difficult uh, battle within the party rather than just build broader civil society support in the first place? Um, and when it comes to building that connection between top and base, we spoke before, I can't really say in a positive sense what has to be done. I think we're still in a period of experimentation uh, to see what actually works. I think the way uh, we can see what shouldn't be done 
is that Momentum, again, focused very, very heavily on digital outreach, um, really saw itself as a kind of digital platform party that didn't really have to rely on membership, that relied on online voting uh, to get all its procedures through. And in a sense, this is highly effective within specific contexts in, in elections, but it doesn't actually bind a constituency to you in any, um, uh, how shall we put it, in any lasting way. So Momentum was able to generate a lot of buzz in 2017 and got the right numbers of voters uh, mobilized in uh, mainly the London boroughs. But what you saw in 2019 or in December, and I saw it myself as I was canvassing across the country, is that Momentum basically had to send buses down to the north to get London-based activists to knock on the doors of Labour voters in the north. And this means that Momentum had basically concentrated all of its resources on the London uh, area, where it was immensely powerful, where loads of people showed up to canvas, who, as they realized that you actually need to win in the entirety of the country to get into government, they basically started busing people to the north rather than thinking, what should we have done to actually build up local power base for Momentum in the north? And I'm not saying that, that would have been an easier task, but at least it would have been a smarter question to ask than just say, okay, we can just parachute all these Londoners into the North at the risk of creating this impression that uh, you're basically sending a kind of humanitarian brigade to convince these people to vote for their interests. Um, rather than saying, what would it mean for Corbynism to have bases all across the country in all kinds of social layers? <clears throat> Thank you, Anton. Um, so we were going to break out into small groups, but we've had such good questions come through the chat um, that um, we, we've spent a lot of time in this large group and uh, we're running close to 730. So breaking out would um, kind of hinder this flow and, and um, we wouldn't have enough time to get into a good small group discussion. So we're going to keep it at this large group uh, level. Um, and at this time, kind of open it up for people to be able to um, uh, speak for themselves instead of me reading their questions. Um, and you can uh, make a comment or ask a question by uh, raising your hand. There's a raise hand feature in the chat. Um, so if you want to do that, um, click that feature and I'll be able to see it and I'll um, essentially put you on a stack. Uh, I do ask that you keep it, um, keep your comment or question um, to a, a two minimum, minimum or maximum, I'm sorry. Um, so um, it, it should not go longer than two minutes so that we can make sure that everyone who wants to speak has a chance to do so. Uh, so are there any, um, any takers who wanna ask? Okay, I have Mike who would like to speak. Um, I also am going to need my co-host to help me find people so I can unmute uh, in a timely manner. So, um, Mike F., it would help me if you had your video on. I cannot find you. Uh, I think it's on. There you go. All can right. You? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, I wrote my question out, so I'll read it. It should be less than two minutes, though. Uh, Dustin identified third-partyism with sectarianism and considers it a dead end. Yet the establishment doesn't see it this way. The Democratic Party has in the past spent millions of dollars and hired teams of lawyers to keep the Green Party off the ballot in various states, despite the party's very small size. They saw a dangerous potential rather than a dead end. And the burning or bust position of DSA shocked and frightened the establishment. This was reflected in articles and editorials in the New York Times. And even this partial break with the Democratic Party, that is, we will not support any corporate Democrats, was a matter of concern. How much more concern would a complete break create? Does the establishment understand the potential of third partyism better than we do? Marissa, do you want me to respond right now or do you want to take a few questions and then respond? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I think Mike, is that right? Is that your name? Yes. Uh, Mike, I think um, I, I, I totally disagree. And here's why. We had never had a slogan, the Green Party would have won. Yet a slogan that captured the minds of millions and millions of people in this country was Bernie would have won. And there was a real fear in the Democratic Party that Bernie could have won in two elections. And 
That fear has never taken hold in the Democratic Party establishment. The reason the Democratic Party spends millions to stop the Greens is precisely because they can spoil an election, but they can never win an election. If you have the power to spoil an election, you have the power to anger a lot of people in the Democratic establishment, but you certainly don't have the power to make them change their behavior. If you have the power to win an election, then suddenly you have the challenge that, that the Democrats have in front of them. No Green Party candidate has ever had the power to win an election. But Bernie Sanders had the power to win an election. So I think that you have to understand that the Greens are able to lose elections for the Democrats, but they're never able to win an election for an alternative. We have to be able to win an election for an alternative if we want to strike fear in the hearts of the establishment of both major parties. That's the key difference. And I think it's something that we have to keep in mind. This talk about third parties being able to push the Democrats to the left simply is fantasy because there's never been a third party that has gained enough of a constituency that it has pushed the Democratic Party to the left. The, the groups of people that have actually pushed the Democratic Party to the left have been mass unions plus strikes and giant, giant organizations that are far larger than any third party we've ever seen in the, minor, in the, in the modern era. So again, the Greens can lose an election for the Dems, but they can never win an election on their own. And we need to be able to win elections. It's a reasonable answer. Okay, so I have Paul on stack, and then I also have um, Michelle on stack after that. Um, I, uh, I, she just reminded me that um, I, I want to make sure that everyone knows we encourage people to ask um, basic questions, you know, questions that they might think are stupid because other people probably are thinking the same thing and could benefit from the answer. So please don't shy away from asking those questions. So uh, Paul is up next, and then uh, Michelle will be after. Thanks. Um, am I unmuted? Yes. OK. Um, so this question when, relates to um, uh, party surrogates and the role they can play with uh, political education. And I think it can apply to both US and Euro European um, contexts. But um, so coming from Philly DSA, I'm proud of our political education events, but I think, you know, honestly, we're, it's not like we're reaching yet a lot of working class people, you know, we're, we're mostly reaching our own members. So how do you see that maybe working with, as a non-electoral thing party surrogates can do, how might they be able to help build more political education among more working class people that aren't already on the left? That's a great question. <laughs> Something we ask ourselves every day. Um, Anton or, or Dino, do you want to take that up? You know, Anton, you're, yeah. you want me to go first? All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, Paul, I think that you know from our work in Philly that this is a critical part of building political militants, right? And the political education committee in, honestly, Lower Manhattan DSA, I've heard it has done really great things around building its, uh, uh, the Bernie policy platform school and all of that has been exactly what a uh, party surrogate or any kind of socialist organization should be doing, which is arming people with the kinds of ideas necessary for them to do their political work. And I wanna say two things about political education further, which is the truth is the only reason any of us uh, do this insane thing, which is to participate in a socialist organization is because we have a genuine ideological commitment. And that moral and ideological commitment can only exist if it is fostered through political education. And so it's really important to actually have people intellectually engaged in your organization. If you don't have that, there's no rational reason for a person to be involved in the struggle because we're too weak to win, right? And if you're too weak to win, you need people who are engaged on a, on a level of ideological, moral, and political commitment beyond the possibility of winning the next election. So I think political education is absolutely crucial and it's something that organizations like DSA really need to prioritize. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Dustin. Uh, Anton, do you want to speak to that question? I honestly would be curious to hear how um, historically organizations have done this in the past uh, in order to, you know, arm their, their, um, their members with um, the political tools and thinking um, to, to take a lead on demanding some of these things. So if, if you have any perspective on that, that would be wonderful. Hold on, hold on. Uh, go ahead, you're unmuted. Yeah, 
Um, <clears throat> no, again, I think I broadly agree with what Dustin was saying, and I'll try and adapt it more to a European context. Um, I think these questions on whether you need party surrogacy or whether you actually need to take over an existing party depend a lot on what kind of party systems are available. I think in the UK, the options for a third party to the left of Labour, if it turns out that Labour just becomes an even more hollow husk and becomes what you could call a British version of, uh, of Macron, where Macron has a, a pseudo party which is populated by technocrats, which has no real popular base, which theoretically does sortition to get its legislators in place, but which is actually just a way for um, the French ruling class to channel all kinds of its puppets into government. Um, then if Labour ends up like this, there's maybe a real discussion whether there should be a third party. But at the same time, given how the British elections uh, system is ordered, again, it is so, so difficult uh, to even get any kind of representation in the House of Commons. You see this even with right-wing parties such as UKIP, which actually get a very high percent, percentage of votes in elections, but which don't manage to get any of their uh, members into parliaments because the threshold is so high that it doesn't even make sense to think of third parties in that context. Um, what I do think, um, I mean, there's a kind of chicken and egg question where what I hoped left populism could have done in the 2010s, uh, for example, is that Corbyn got into power and was able to lessen some of the anti-trade union le legislation that makes it so difficult for British workers to actually engage in militant activity. Um, because, for example, um, I'm, in a, I'm in a union, an academic union, which is obviously not representative of what we want the left to look like. But, for example, unions spend an enormous, a British union spend an enormous amount of their resources just getting people to vote in their elections because you need to pass a 50% threshold to be able to legally call for a strike. So if you decide to strike and not 50% of your members have voted, then you're technically in engaging in uh, an illegal strike action and the police can basically disband it and force you to go back to work. Um, and if you were able to repeal this kind of prohibitive anti-union legislation, it would actually make it easier for people to engage in strike activity at the same time. Um, but at the same time, Corbyn getting into government is clearly something that can only be done on the back of really uh, concretely existing class power. So there's a kind of chicken and egg problem. Uh, at, the, at the same time. Um, and I think I side with uh, Dustin here, which is something he said in a conversation to me recently, is um, given that the Labour Party now seems to be more inaccessible than it was before, you'll actually have to concentrate your efforts on building those uh, left-wing civil society institutions. But even as you're building those institutions, and is, as is when you're building uh, power on the shop floor, you'll have to be making political decisions all the time. So there is no need separation between doing purely social work and then uh, committing yourself to politics. Even as, as you're organizing on the level of society, you'll constantly have to make decisions on how you relate to the state. Um, and I think this is a lesson that uh, a lot of these left populists in the rest of Europe should be heeding as well is, look, we tried it. Uh, it was clear uh, that we had our shot at entering into government. But even a party like Podemos, which is basically now in government with the Social Democrats, find itself forced to water down its program to such an extent where it was, it was founded to end European austerity and now it's basically a manager of European austerity slightly to the left. That it needs to think very, very hard on kind, what kind of power do we need if we actually want to enact our radical program and how can uh, parties, once they're in power, actually help uh, these uh, social forces to develop themselves more fully. <clears throat> Thank you guys for uh, being on to give your presentations. It was definitely um, really clarifying and it was uh, a dose of reality with a shot of adrenaline. <laughs>